back in 2005, there was a movie called Cinderella Man. Cinderella Man was this movie starring award-winning actors Russell Crowe, Renee Zellweger, and Paul Giamatti that was about the life, the times, and the trials of former world heavyweight boxing champion James Braddock. In this movie, it gave us the depiction Braddock was this family man who was at one point rich and successful. Um, as well as one of the top boxers in the world. He had lost his money during the Great Depression. Uh, he fought his way up the ranks, got a title shot, and brought his family up from poverty. But there is a story that is even more interesting. Correction. There's a story that is far, far more interesting than the story of James Braddock's brief battle with poverty. And that is the job that he did on Joe Lewis. In this video, I'm going to discuss how Joe Lewis won the fight, but James Braddock won the war. In this video, I'm going to discuss what happened to Joe Lewis at the hands of James Braddock and how it affected not just Joe Lewis's career, but Joe Lewis's life. Stay tuned. Hey yo, Harlem World, what up? Shout out to my man, Big Raw Roads 140. Hey yo, Trail, what up? Hey yo, I do spit like two clips. My part of town, the grass is brown. So how I'm tiptoeing through tulips, feel the music. You can use it, but don't abuse it. Accept or reject it, but just don't disrespect it. Christ was resurrected, life is hectic. And for the record, just before I wreck it, his second coming is unexpected. Last day's fulfillment of the word of the prophets. But all America is really concerned with its prophets. Through eclectic ways as crime escalates, as kids is catching AIDS, through sexcapades and escalates. So you thugs and you street heads need to give your life to Christ before your wig gets split like the Red Sea. I'm just warming up. Through all the hurt and pain, my style remain calm like the eye of a hurricane. What if they had a hood in Genesis? Would they be serving Cain? Would able peeps take revenge and try to murder Cain? I ran in the streets, Satan got a plan in the streets. Get everybody thinking they the man in the streets. You wanna see me, you and your crew, blasted with heat. So it's no coincidence, we lost some of our mans in the streets. Our mans is deceased because they ran with the beast. Rejected Christ's plan for their life and instead chose the plan of the beast. If you love blasting the heat and cats in the street, without Jesus, your destiny is weeping and gnashing a teeth. What's up guys, this is 74 of Boxing Aficionados and before I begin, please subscribe to my channel. If you're not subscribed already, hit the like button and leave a comment below. Also, follow my page on Facebook. Uh, it's Boxing Aficionados. Now, Boxing Aficionados is a closed community. So, um, you are gonna be uh, screened uh, be, because I mean, we had to do that, man. Because there, there's some, there's some people with some different agendas, man. I had some people post some crazy, some crazy videos, man. So I have to screen that community. Uh, also, share this video with others who you think will find this video interesting. So, back in 1937, uh, times were much, much different than what they are now especially in the sport of boxing. You know, until the 60s, there were segregated world boxing championships. And uh, following the title reign of Jack Johnson, which was from 1908 to 1915, black heavyweights were avoided like the plague. There were some exceptional black heavyweight fighters back in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, uh, while white fighters, you know, they just didn't want to fight them. So, you know, of course, after Jack Johnson was defeated by Jess Willard 
And again, this was 37 year old Jack Johnson, you know, who had been on top of the game for a long time. Jack Johnson was defeated by Jess Willard. Uh, Jess Willard was defeated by Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey was defeated by Gene Tunney. You know, you know how it goes. And, and just, just for the record, there was Jess Willard. There was Jack Dempsey. There was Gene Tunney. Uh, there was Max Schmeling. Uh, there was Jack Sharkey. There was Primo Carnera. There was Max Bear. And then there was James Braddock. So, 22 years until we got another black world heavyweight champion. And, and, and again, um, times were much, much different than what they are now. So, it wasn't, like, as it was encouraged that white fighters didn't fight black fighters, okay? Uh, and again, there were some exceptional black fighters back in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm for right now, just for the record, I'm just referring to leading up to the time before Joe Lewis was champion. So, you know, of course you had Harry Wills, you had Sam Langford, you had Elmer Ray, you had Jersey Joe Walcott, you had Jimmy Bivens. I mean, and then also, if you really want to mention them, you know, you had uh, Archie Moore, you know, j just, just to name a few. But white fighters, again, did not want to fight black fighters and neither did their promoters, their managers, uh, their trainers, uh, the fans or the media. And the closest fight we ever had uh, that was that had been close to materializing, following Jack Johnson versus uh, following Jack Johnson, uh, was Harry Wills versus Jack Dempsey. And what happened was that the New York State Athletic Commission didn't want the fight. Uh, Demp, Demp, Jack Dempsey didn't want the fight. Uh, and Wills actually tried to sue Dempsey for the breach of contract, but again, the times were different, and it wasn't viewed as being politically incorrect to say that blacks were second class citizens. So, uh, you know, of course, um, because, and I'm not just saying this, this ain't no, uh, social justice warrior, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, LeBron James type of rant. Uh, this, this is what was really going on in the United States, you know, because most, uh, a great deal of the country was Jim, you know, there was Jim Crow, uh, but then those, those northern states that were not conformed to Jim Crow laws, which is an equivalent to African apartheid, uh, or African apartheid was actually inspired by Jim Crow. But, you also had, you know, you also had a, um, in the northern states, uh, the northern states really were no different. Um, and as a matter of fact, when people like Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, people like Joe Lewis, Jack Johnson, when those particular fighters were active, and, and I'll, I'll even throw in uh, Dick Tiger, uh, because Dick Tiger he had um, he had defeated um, he had defeated Harry Greb. Uh, I mean, we can go on and on about this, man. We we could talk about the, we we can say a whole lot about this, but you know, Dick Tiger defeated Harry Greb. Uh, you know, again, you had Sugar Ray Robinson, you know, he was welterweight champion, then he became middleweight champion. Um, I mean, we can just talk a whole lot about this. And what was happening was that um, they didn't want black fighters to fight other black fighters. The, you know, black fighters, it was, you know, it was okay that they fought white fighters. Uh, but it was not okay for black fighters to fight other black fighters. They didn't want that happening. The only way that was going to happen is if you was fighting for the World Color Championship. They, you know, you could not fight another black fighter for for the World Heavyweight Championship because what it did, it just made it seem as if as if 
black, you know, if, if you had two black fighters fighting for the world heavyweight championship or fighting for any like world championship, that would make it appear as though blacks are blacks are superior fighter to fighters to whites. So back in the day, it was okay for a white fighter to fight a white fighter. But it was not okay for uh, you know, and it was okay for a black fighter to fight a white fighter. But it was not okay for a black fighter to fight another black fighter unless it was for the World Color Championship. And no one really reported the World Color Championship. Okay. So, um, while the bout was the end of Braddock's career, you know, when, when James Braddock fought Joe Lewis, because the out of those 22 years in which you didn't have a world champion, world heavyweight champion, um, and during that 22 year period where the white world champions, you know, were the fighters, their managers, their trainers, the promoters, the fans, the media didn't want them fighting black fighters. Um, during that 22 year period, uh, they, they, you know, they didn't even want to give black fighters a chance. Like the, and, and the media wouldn't report on them, but James Braddock decided that he was going to give the black a title shot, that he was going to give a black fighter a title shot. And while this bout was the end of Braddock's career, and as a major boxing force, fighting only once after this fight, part of his contract with Joe Lewis was to gain a portion of Joe Lewis's earnings over the next decade, okay? So, just like Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis was such a great fighter, his greatness was undeniable. And James Braddock, prior to fight, fighting Max Baer, had 87 career fights. So James Braddock was arguably boxing's greatest overachiever. In his fights against Corn Griffin and Art Lasky and Max Baer, uh, you know, these were fights that he was not expected to win. As a matter of fact, um, Corn Griffin was expected to knock him out. And Max Bear was just expected to kill him, like literally kill him, you know, um, as it was depicted in the movie. And there was nowhere for him to go but down. So especially after he won the World Heavyweight Championship, there was nowhere for him to go but down. And uh, after defeating Max Bear in June of 1935, uh, James Braddock, he had a two year layoff. Now. He claims that it was due to hand problems, which it probably was because, I mean, there was one point where he broke his hand in several places. Uh, so there was a point in his career that, you know, that he had 33 fights. OK, and that was from 1929 to 1933. So 29, 30, 31, 32. 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, that was four years. In that four year period, he had 33 fights. In that four period where he had 33 fights, his record was 11, 20, and 2. Okay? So, and there were fights that he had that were so lackluster that he didn't get paid. And he probably did not want to continue fighting. Okay, because he, he really took those fights. The, the motivating factor behind him taking those fights was money. He took those fights because he wanted to get paid. And and again, you know, these were fights where he weren't he wasn't doing very good. So, you know, he had an 11, 20 and two record. And again, he probably did not want to continue fighting. So. How did we get Joe Lewis versus James Braddock? How did we get it? So several months later, after um, James Braddock defeated Max Baer, Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling of Germany then fought their first fight on June 19th of 1936 to determine who would meet Braddock for the championship. Now, this was the first fight Joe Lewis had against Max Schmeling. So, of course, you know, that was the fight Joe Lewis, you know, was throwing his jab. He had his he had his left hand down too low 
and Schmeling kept countering him with the right hand. And uh, Schmeling knocked out Lewis in the 12th round and was named the number one contender for boxings uh, for, for the World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, after the Lewis Schmeling fight, Braddock announced that he would be glad to defend his title against Schmeling. And he says that he he thinks that he can beat him. And if Lewis makes a comeback, he said he would be willing to take him on, too. So, of course, you know, boxers are going to say this because they don't want to come across as like afraid or ducking. You know, boxers don't want to come across as cowards, right? They want to come across as someone who will fight anybody. And so in 1936, his title defense in Madison Square Garden against the German Max Schmeling was canceled under what, what some reporters say are suspicious circumstances. Now, here's what happened. The Braddock Schmeling fight was scheduled for September 24th, 1936 in New York. And now both boxers signed contracts and paid deposits ensuring the fight. Uh, in August of 1936, Schmeling came to America to start training for the fight. And on August 17th, Braddock complained of arthritis in his left thumb. And this guy named Colonel Reed Kilpatrick a president of the Madison Square Garden Corporation and James J. Johnson, the boxing director of New York State, they postponed the fight in June of 1937. Now, there was this guy named Joe Gould, who was the manager of James Braddock, who shocked boxing fans by announcing that his fighter had accepted an offer of $500,000 from a Chicago syndicate to bypass Schmeling and to fight Joe Lewis in Chicago on June 15th, 1937. And this fight will actually occur uh, June 22nd. Now, Braddock argued that he would have received a $25,000 purse against Schmeling. Now, just for the record, $25,000 in 1937 is an equivalent uh, to about $480,000 today. So that's an increase of about $455,189.24 over 84 years. Okay, so that was 84 years ago, 1937. Um, so, so that's how much $25,000 was worth. Compared to $250,000 against rising star Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis had fought six times in 1936. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, he fought six times in 1936. Schmeling was actually his second fight in 1936. So he fought in January he actually fought in this. So December 13th, 1935, he fought January 17th, 1936. So really like a month after. Uh, and then uh, this is crazy, dude. Like his, his like his resume, Joe Lewis's resume is ridiculous. So check this out. So he fought Primo Carnera. In June of 1935, so Primo Carneros, former world champion, he fought this guy named King uh, Levinsky, uh, Levinsky in uh, August of 1935. Then, right after, um, I, I want to say right after Schmeling, I mean, right after Braddock defeated Max Baer. Joe Lewis knocks Max Bear out in four rounds. And then, you know, he fought this guy named uh, Uskadoon. And then he fought this guy named Charlie Resloff. Then, and then that's when he fought Max Schmeling. And that was considered an upset because Max Schmeling knocked him out. Uh, but then he fights Jack Sharkey, who's former world champion. And then he fought this guy named uh, Al Etor, Joe Brescia. And, uh, and then Ed Sim. So, so he, in 1936, he fought, he fought like six times. So then he comes 1937, um, he fights three times leading up to the Braddock fight. And so, so you, you know how, like when, when boxers, when they lose, 
uh, especially if, the, if a boxer gets knocked out. What typically do promote do their promoters, do their managers, you know, do their um, do their um, their trainers, you know, do what typically what they what they do to these guys is that they give them these real easy fights. You know, they give them these real easy fights to try to rebuild their confidence. So after he loses to Max Schmeling. They give him a very hard fight. They give him Jack Sharkey, you know, and so Jack Sharkey, Jack Sharkey was a former world champ and Jack Sharkey was still kind of like still in the ranks. So he fought Jack Sharkey, you know, he fought, you know, he, he fought a few guys, uh, but then Bob Pastor, Bob Pastor was a good fighter too. And so then there was James Braddock. So again, you know, uh, Joe Lewis, you know, of, of course, you know, he was a he was a rising star. So. Um, and so, you know, again, Braddock argued that he would have received, uh, you know, twenty five thousand. And, and I told you twenty five thousand is like an equivalent to four hundred eighty thousand a day compared to two hundred and fifty thousand against Joe Lewis. So twenty uh, two hundred fifty thousand is an equivalent to about four point five million today. Okay, and so there was also a concern, and, and I can understand this too. There was a concern that if Max Schmeling won, the Nazi government would deny American fighters opportunities to fight for the title, and. After Jesse Owens did what he did during the 1936 Olympics, there really was a 1,000 percent chance that the that the Germans were going to absolute we're going to say absolutely not to Lewis versus Schmeling too. So, and, and here's another thing: James Braddock wouldn't have been able to to take advantage of Schmeling the way he took advantage of Joe Lewis. So here's what happened. In order for Joe Lewis to get a title shot against James Braddock, Joe Lewis contractually agreed to pay James Braddock 10% of his earnings over the next 10 years. Okay? So, in addition to that, in addition to that, paying James Braddock 10% of his earnings over the next 10 years, uh, Joe Lewis's promoter, Michael Strauss Jacobs, was giving Joe Lewis cash advances that Joe Lewis had to pay back with interest. And 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 so you think about this in terms of James Braddock. How many fights did Joe Lewis have in 10 years? Right? So what happened after Joe Lewis beat James Braddock? You saw one of the greatest heavyweight championship runs and one of the greatest championship runs in boxing history in 10 fights Joe Lewis had 20 and I'm just talking about so, okay in 11 years in, uh, Joe Lewis had 27 fights 27 title, title defenses so, but from 1937 to 1947 was the time in which Joe Lewis was under contract with J James Braddock. So that's 26 fights from 1937 to 1947. And most of the, I, I guess, you know, some sources say 4.6 million that Joe Lewis was said to have earned during his prime years was during this time. So this, this was the best Joe Lewis right here. This this was prime Joe Lewis. So from again from 1937 to 1947. This was also during the time that Joe Lewis was serving in the military during World War II. Joe Lewis served from 1941 to 1945. Of course, you know that Joe Lewis got out of the army with the rank of staff sergeant. Joe Lewis was all while he was in the army. Now, here's another thing. People from the UK, uh, people from, you know, Sweden and, you know, others, you know, need to understand that Joe Lewis 
um, th- that even though Joe Lewis entered the Army draft, and you know, as well as like you know, uh, as a ch- not not uh, was it? I think it was as a Charles, but during those times, um, Joe Lewis was uh, J- Joe Lewis was part. Uh, he he was like in in uh, the what, what, what do you call it like platoon or whatever, but it was segregated. So the these blacks weren't allowed to be around whites. And World War II was a little bit different because blacks typically didn't get a lot of combat time because uh, it was the combat time that would increase your rank. So uh, I think James Braddock had like a rank of a lieutenant. Uh, but Joe Lewis, you know, I think the highest rank he achieved was like staff sergeant. But yeah, Joe Lewis wasn't, you know, Joe Lewis was, you know, his, his, like, I don't know if you guys ever seen this movie, but it was called Men of Honor with Robert De Niro and Cuba Gooding Jr. And during this time of, you know, during World War II, uh, blacks could only be cooks. They, they could be cooks and like and a, a military equivalent of janitors. You know, they would not allow blacks to get combat time. So, so again, man, I mean, the, the military, uh, uh, like everything about the United States, it's different from what it is today. People like Joe Lewis paved the way for people like me. People like Joe Lewis paved the way for people like Floyd Mayweather, you know, Tommy Hitman Hearns, Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, and even people, even fighters in the UK, people like Joe Lewis paved the way for them. And, uh, I mean, and it, it, it was, it was sad to see what, you know, what happened to Joe Lewis. But let me, let me mention this other thing. One of the reasons why some of these places in the United States did not want white fighters to fight black fighters, because now I, I in the previous channel that I had, I mentioned this before about Jack Johnson. But imagine, if you will, a black fighter beating a white fighter and the white community would get so pissed that they would go into a black community and start lynching black people. That, that, I mean, again, I mean, this was the type of stuff black people experience. And, and, and honestly, this is why I get so, I get so frustrated with people today with a lot of these pamper and privileged black people today, you know, just calling anything and everything racism, you know, because we didn't experience what people like Joe Lewis experienced. You know, we didn't people, we, we didn't experience, and, and a lot of these boxers and a lot of these athletes today, they didn't experience what these fighters experienced. And so, you know, this thing that happened between Joe Lewis and James Braddock is a perfect example of that. So, again, uh, Joe Lewis served during the time of World War II. He served from 1941 to 1945. He got out of the military with the rank of a staff sergeant. So I think a staff sergeant was like an E5. And, um, you know, he was in a, he was in a segregated troop. And um, there was, I, I think there was something about his draft status. But, but I want to say he enlisted. I want to say he just volunteered. But anyway, uh, look, just look at what the United States government did to this man. Wikipedia says that the reason Joe Lewis went broke was because despite Joe Lewis's lucrative purses over the years, they referred to Joe Lewis's purses as lucrative. <laughs> that, but, but that was a joke. Most of the proceeds went, say, they said most of the proceeds went to his handlers, but they wouldn't mention who his handlers were. The, uh, his money was going to his handlers and the IRS. Uh, of the 4.6 million earned during his boxing career, Lewis himself received only about $800,000. Lewis was never, nevertheless, extremely generous to his family, paying for homes, cars, and education for his parents and siblings, often with money fronted by Jacobs. So, uh, by, by Michael Strauss Jacobs, 
you know, he was providing Joe Lewis those that money through cash advances in which Joe Lewis had to pay back to Jacobs. But it is also Joe Lewis invested in a number of businesses, all of which eventually failed, including the Joe Lewis restaurant, the Joe Lewis insurance company, uh, I guess a softball team called the Brown Bombers, the Joe Lewis milk company, Joe Lewis pomade hair product, Joe Lewis punch, uh, Joe, uh, the Joe Lewis Rower PR firm, a horse form and the rum buggy cafe in Chicago. And of course, there was also business partners who was ripping them off. Uh, very similar thing happened to Joe Frazier, uh, in Philadelphia where Joe Lewis was, uh, Joe Lewis was, there, there was people, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of athletes, you know, when people, uh, approach them, with these business deals, you know, people, they're like, man, get out of my face with that, <laughs> you know, because you, you have people that have like these, you know, these scams, you know, and of course, you know, they, they get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions from fighters and they just rip them off. And, and these boxers, man, a lot of these boxers are really nice guys, man. You know, like you you hear stories about people like, you know, Mike Tyson. You know, hear about a lot of these, they're very kind and generous people. And oftentimes what happens, man, is that these boxers, you know, they're giving people, they're giving people money, man, who come to them with these sob stories. And, um, you know, and, you know, you think about that, because uh, I heard the same thing at one point about Leon Spinks, was that Leon Spinks was just, just a very generous dude. You know, he partied a lot, but he was a generous dude. And that was one of the reasons why Leon Spinks, you know, went broke before he passed away. Um... He gave, he liberally, liberally gave, he gave liberally to the government as well, paying back the city of Detroit for any welfare money him and his family had received. Because I guess back in the day, if you received any type of welfare, you had to pay it back. And I think James Braddock did the same thing. Joe Lewis was also donating money that was from the looks of things because he owed so much of back taxes. You know, uh, whoever his accountant were, was, you know, they screwed him over because Joe Lewis wasn't able to write that off. Uh, Joe Lewis found himself owing the government most of his purse money from each of his fights. So during the 1940s, the top marginal rate was hiked to 90 percent. And Joe Lewis found himself with over five hundred thousand dollars in debt to the IRS and back taxes. Uh, Joe Lewis had to pay the government 90% of his fight purse and 10% of his purse to James Braddock in addition to paying his his uh, his promoter, um, you know, uh, for those cash advances. Um, the government tried to make the public believe that they love Joe Lewis so much. You know, for example, President Franklin D. Roosevelt squeezed Joe Lewis's bicep at the White House and declared that 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 th that his muscles were the kind of muscles the country was going to need to beat the Nazis. They were using Joe Lewis for propaganda purposes, while at the same time putting Joe Lewis in a poorhouse. So this is why new media is so important because we expose people who who the mainstream legacy boxing media view as heroes, pioneers, or visionaries who were actually horrible people. Joe Lewis spent his entire life, his entire boxing career, uh, making people rich. In the Joe Lewis biography, it was said that Joe Lewis was broke and broken. It says in 1969, he was hospitalized after collapsing on a New York City street. And it says while the incident was credited to physical breakdown, it was probably stress. 
You know, one of the reasons men have shorter lifespans than women is because men are willing to do virtually anything to provide for their families. Men are willing to do high risk, life threatening type of things to be able to provide for their families. And you have this legendary boxer with this legendary boxing career. Uh, he, he's accomplished so much. You know, and, and actually, he's he accomplished what no other boxer has ever accomplished. And you ha- and, and basically, Joe Lewis had nothing to show for it. And by this time, 1969, he was past his prime. He was long retired. He can't compete anymore. Also, keep in mind that as a former boxer, he's probably suffering from CTE, anxiety, stress, He spent five months at the Colorado Psychiatric Hospital and the Veterans Administration Hospital in Denver. Uh, He was also hospitalized by his wife, Martha, and his son, Joe Louis Barrow Jr. for paranoia. And it was said that following Joe Louis's retirement, uh, it was said that Frank Sinatra helped Joe Louis get a job in Las Vegas. So Joe Louis... uh, Prior to the breakdown and him passing out out in New York, uh, he was working at Caesar's Palace um, and they lent Joe Lewis a house in Las Vegas and hired him as a $50,000 per year host in residence. And and Joe Lewis said his main job is shaking hands, uh, noting that uh, only half in jest that one of his assignments was uh, swaying uh, high rollers who lost big money to the house. So, you know, Joe Lewis, man, um, all that that he accomplished in boxing, um, and, and really very similar thing happened to Muhammad Ali, but Muhammad Ali kind of dodged a bullet because, like, well, Muhammad Ali, um, at, at a certain point in his life, Muhammad Ali. He was able to sell his likeness, I think, for a hundred million dollars. So, you know, um, he was able to do something with his likeness. You know, they weren't offering Joe Lewis this type of this type of stuff. Uh, And Joe Lewis wasn't like Ali. You know, Joe Lewis was very soft spoken, you know, very kind of quiet and laid back and reserved type of dude. He did his talking in the rain. And uh, I mean, it's just sad to see that though this dude died broke, you know, and he died broke because, you know, there was a lot of people around him taking advantage of him, uh, including and especially James Braddock. And again, you know, James Braddock had a lot to do with Joe Lewis dying poor. I mean, you, you think about it. I mean. It seems like a good idea, but, you know, again, racism in America, you know, uh, at, you know, today, think about today's standards. Think about today if Deontay Wilder was to fight Tyson Fury or like, let's say, let, let's give, let me give you another example. Um, you have Jamal Charlo or something and Jamal Charlo uh, is trying to fight Canelo and Canelo is like okay I'll fight you you know I'll fight you uh, but you gotta give me 10% of your purse for the next 10 years or for the remainder of your career you gotta give me 10% of your purse um, You know, we heard about Manny Pacquiao was getting these cash advances from Bob Arum and, you know, having to pay it back. Uh, You know, so, you know, boxing is, it's it's a cold blooded sport, man. You got these gladiators. You got these gladiators. You got these tough guys, these warriors. And, you know, the, 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 the biggest threat to boxers are promoters. You know, or all of these people, and let's not even mention the women, the freaking gold diggers. You know, let's not even mention them. 
But but these boxers, man, I mean, the, these are people who, you know, they're not, a lot of these dudes are not educated. They're not very business savvy. They're just muscle. You know, they just, they're just there to fight. And you have all of these people, uh, you know, getting in their lives, you know, all of these sociopaths getting in their lives, taking advantage of them. And that's basically what happened to Joe Lewis. So anyway, man, that's, that's all I have for right now. Uh, leave your comments below. Uh, thank you for watching. Holla at you guys later. Peace.